All right, guys, welcome to our uh, review test study guide, which is going to be due on Wednesday. Um, you guys have the answers for all the odd ones already, so I'm going to leave you guys to do those ones to check to see if you get the answers right yourself. As for the even ones, I'll be showing you guys how to do those. All right. So the first one says write the write g of x, which is the dashed line. So g of x is this green dashed line in terms of f of x, which is the blue solid line. Now, I, I'm going to change the directions a little bit just so it makes maybe, I don't know, my opinion a little bit more sense. Is I'm going to change the directions to this. What would you have to do to the blue line to make it look more like the green line? Well, I can see that there's a couple things that we would have to do. Um, one thing that we would have to do is we would have to flip it upside down. Now the fancy word for that is a reflection. Okay. More specifically, we're reflecting it in the x-axis. When you flip something upside down, what you're doing is you're flipping it over the x-axis, and so we call that a reflection in the x-axis. Okay. So if I want the blue line to end up like the green line, I would have had to reflect it in the x-axis and flip it upside down, right? But as you guys can see here also, it's a little bit whiter. It looks a little bit fatter than the other one, okay? Now there's two ways that you can make a shape whiter, all right? One way you can make a shape whiter is by pulling, stretching it horizontally. Okay, so if I took both of those legs and started, imagine it like being silly putty and I just stretch it horizontally. Well, that's going to make it look wider. So one way you can make it look wider is with a horizontal push. Another way you can make something look wider is if you do a vertical compression. Once again, think of silly putty. If you smash it vertically, it's going to flatten it out. It's going to make it look wider, right? So a vertical compression will also make it look wider. Now, it's only going to be one of those. They're not going to do both, although technically you could do both. But it's either a horizontal stretch or a vertical compression. So really, we're looking for two transformations. We're looking for one that will be a reflection in the x-axis, flip it upside down. And we're looking for one of these two down here. All right. Now, I'm going to recommend you guys to go back to your 3.2 notes from a little while ago because that's going to come in pretty handy for the first few problems. Um, so, first of all, let's look for flipping it upside down or reflect, reflecting it in the x-axis. Well, that's right here, right? So, we're going to find that first and then we're going to identify, well, what do we have to do to the function? Well, as you can see, you're going to put a negative outside the function. So we're looking for a function with a negative outside of it. There's only one option here that has that. There it is. The other ones do not have negatives outside the parentheses. So right away, we already know the answer. Just for fun, though, let's look at the other ones. Because it, it was, remember how we said it was either a horizontal stretch or a vertical compression. So here's a vertical compression. And here's a horizontal stretch. Now, for a vertical compression, you multiply by a number outside the parentheses that is less than 1. And for a horizontal stretch, you multiply by a number inside the parentheses by a number that is less than 1. So either way, if you multiply by a number inside or outside the parentheses by a number less than 1, it's going to make it look flatter, right? And so as you can see, they put a number inside the parentheses. In this case, that would be a horizontal stretch when it's inside the parentheses. Well, it's not a vertical compression. But like I said, we didn't really need to do that last part because we knew what the answer was just by looking at the reflection. All right, let's go ahead and take a look then at number four. Uh, all right, interesting. It's pretty much the same thing, right? It's been flipped upside down, and we're looking for one that is... So we're looking for one that has a negative outside the parentheses again. So it's either this one or it's this one. Now we have two choices to pick from. But we know it's not C or B because it needs to have a negative outside the parentheses. 
What else? Well, um, it's wider again, so we need to be multiplying by a number less than 1, either inside or outside the parentheses. So the answer is B, because a half is less than 1. The 2 is greater than 1, so that would be actually something that makes it look um, skinny. All right, so there's that. Let's go ahead and move on to another type of question. On number six, I tell you, okay, we have a function. f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And what we want to do with it is we want to do these two transformations to it. But it's the same thing. It's actually just a little bit easier because uh, with the graphs, you had to figure out what happened to the shapes. For numbers, uh, for these problems, basically what you're doing is you are being told what's happened to the shapes already, and they're not telling you, they're not giving you the graph. So it's actually easier. We just need to actually find these statements on the list that we have. So as you can see here, we have a vertical compression. So there's that. So that means we're looking for one in which we are multiplying by a number outside the parentheses, and that number should be less than one. So let's look for it. We're looking for where we're multiplying by a number outside the parentheses less than one. That's not it. Two is bigger. You, you, we're ignoring the sign. That's a reflection. So you just look at the number. And two is not less than one. So that's no good. Um, here, we're multiplying inside, so that's no good, that's no good, and there's our answer. We can also see, though, the second part, a reflection across the x-axis because it's a negative outside. Because when you have reflections across the x-axis, that's when you have a negative outside. All right, go ahead and take a look at number 8. Number eight, it tells us that we're reflecting across the x-axis again. And we've seen that quite a few times already. And that, as you know, that means that we are going to be having a negative outside the parentheses. So let's see. We have two choices, B and D. These ones don't work. Part of that. But both B and D have a negative being multiplied outside the parentheses. And then we also want to translate it down three units. Translating down three units means we want to be subtracting a number outside the parentheses. And that would be D, because part B has a number inside. Okay? And so that's basically it. We're just uh, looking at the language and looking for the math code that creates that particular effect. All right, so for... These next problems here on numbers 9, 10, 11, and 12, we're being asked to graph linear functions. Um, when you're graphing a linear function, basically um, they're going to be in slope-intercept form. The first thing you do is you plot your y-intercept, and that's the b value. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to use your slope, which you always need to think of as a fraction. The top number tells you how far to rise. The bottom number tells you how far to run. And that's the basic idea there. Once you have your rise and run, you plot another point, and you connect your second point to your first point, and you've got your line. And that's how you graph linear functions. A couple things to keep in mind. If you have a negative slope, then when you do your rise over run, it's down and over instead of up and over. Another thing to keep in mind, if you're missing your rise or run, or both of them, that means they both equal 1. So if you have a, a missing slope, in other words, or a missing run, you can assume it's 1. If you have a missing y-intercept, in other words, they don't write it, well, then that means it's 0. Okay. So a couple little interesting things to keep in mind as you go. So as I look at this, I can see that we are missing something. 
we're missing our y-intercept. And as we said, when you're missing a y-intercept, it's zero. So I'm just going to go ahead and put a plus zero here. So it looks more like a mx plus b. As you can see, my slope is negative. So that means it's going to be a, a down over instead of an up and over like usual. Okay. And so we're ready to graph. Step one, as I said before, was to plot the y-intercept, which is zero. So I'm just going to put a dot right there at the origin. And then I'm going to go down one, right two. Down one, right. So down one from the origin, and then right two puts me right there. And then if I just connect my dots, that's the graph of the line. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at number 12. Now these are weird ones. Whenever you have y equals a number or x equals a number, basically when you graph those kinds of lines, they're just going to be either vertical or horizontal lines. y equals lines are the horizontal ones. x equals numbers are vertical. So in this case, for number 12, we have a x equals. So it's going to be a vertical line. So what you're going to do is you're going to find that number. 5 on that axis, the x-axis. So I'm going to find 5 on the x-axis, and then I'm going to draw a vertical line through that number. And that's it for the graph there. Moving on to number 14, we're going to talk about graphing absolute value functions. If you want to graph an absolute value function, they typically will have an A in the front kind of acts like your slope. And then you may have a number inside the absolute value brackets, and you may have a number outside the absolute value brackets. These two numbers put together make up your vertex. But you have to remember that the h will always change its sign when you do that. So if you have like a minus 3, then when you write it here, it's going to be a positive 3. Or if you have a positive 3 up here, you'll write a minus 3. But that does not apply to the k. k stays the same. And the way you can kind of tell that from the formula is the one with the negative is the one that you change. Negatives change sign. Uh, this a here acts like a slope, just like it did for linear functions. You have your rise. You have your run. But these guys act a little bit differently. Um, you still go up for your rise, but your run actually goes both directions. Okay. And that's what kind of gives us the V shape is the fact that after we rise, we go right and left, which creates like a V shape for us. Um, and there you have it. All right. So once again, though, just some special details. If you're ever missing one of the following things, you're missing an A, then it's one. If you're missing an H or a K, either one of those are gone, then that means they're zero. Okay. And once again, you know, if, if you have a negative A, like a negative slope, in other words, then your rise over run is actually going to be just like the other linear function that we talked about. You go down instead but your run stays. Okay, so let's go ahead and graph this. Now, as you can see, we're missing some numbers. I don't have a number in front of the absolute value bars. And when we're missing an A, that means it's a one. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that in. Now, you don't have to write it in. If you wanna just do that manually, that's fine. You'll also notice that we're missing the number inside the absolute value bars with the X. We're missing the H, and when the H is missing, that means it's a zero. I'm gonna go ahead and put a zero there. We have our k, so there's that. And as I mentioned before, the 0 and the 5 are what make up your vertex. So we have a negative 5, and then we have a 0. Now, like I said, usually for the 0, this number here, you'd want to change the sign, but 0 doesn't really have a sign, so there's no point in even writing a sign anyway. Um, and then finally, we have our slope. So let's go ahead and graph this. My vertex is going to be a 0, negative 5. And then using my slope, which is negative 1, 
That means I'm going to go down one because it's a negative slope. And I'm going to go to the left and to the right one and put a dot. Oh, um, down one and then right and left one. So down one over one, here's one dot. And then down one over one the other way, there's another dot. And then we go ahead and just connect the dots and you have your absolute value function. So absolute value functions should look like a V-shape when you're older. That's that. Pretty similar to linear functions, just the slope's a little bit different, really. All right, um, let's move on to number 15 here. So I gave you guys the answers to A, C, E, and G. So that means I'm going to do the other ones. So let me start off then with so or B. So um, on the directions, I need to look at those again. One of these is f and the other is g. So I'm going to say that the absolute value function here is f and then the g function is the other one. Let me label these so I don't forget. So the absolute value function is f and the other line. You might want to start doing that yourself. Unfortunately, my software that I use doesn't label these, so it, it, you might want to do that to begin with. In this case, though, in part B, what this means is that x equals negative 4. So what's the y value? So we're looking at the g function. In other words, we're looking at this straight line here. I want to find where x equals negative 4 on that line, which is right there. That point, x equals negative 4. And then the answer is going to be whatever the y value is at that point. So the answer is 1. All right, let's take a look at part D. So we get to do the same thing I just did earlier. Um, I'm going to find what the y value is when x is 2. So let's do that. When x is 2, the y value is 4. So g of 2 equals 4 blank. G of 2 equals 4. Let's find out what f of 2 is. Now, since this is f of 2, we're going to look at the f line now. The f. So I'm going to find where x equals 2 on that line. And the y value that goes with that is negative 5. So f of 2 is negative 5. G of 2 is 4. And we want to add those together. So we end up with negative 1 is my final value. Next one, let's take a look at f. Now, when you have this, this is what we call a composite function. We have a function inside of a function. What you want to do in those cases is you want to start by finding the value of the inside function first. So what is f of negative 3? In other words, what's the y value when x equals negative 3 on the f function? So here's my f function. Let's find where x equals negative 3. And now we can identify the y value that goes with that. And the answer is negative 2. So I can replace this boxed piece here with negative 2. So now instead of g of f of negative 3, I can just put g of 2. Now I get to evaluate it as ask this. What is the, va the y value when x equals 2 on the g function? Here's my g function where x equals 2, and then we'll identify the y value that goes with it, and the answer is 2. Okay, the last one we'll look at here is this, g inverse of 6. That This means inverse, the little negative up there. So just so you remember, usually when you look at these kinds of functions, the one in the parentheses is x, and the one over here is the y. But when you do inverses, reversed. The one in the parentheses is the y and the output is the x. So in this case, we're asking what is the x value when y equals 6 on the g function? If I want to find at what point is there a y value of 6 on the g function. Well up here is where the y value equals 6. And it just so happens, just by coincidence, that the x value is the same. So when the y value equals 6, the, the x value equals 6. Okay. 
And that's how you do inverse functions. Right. And that closes out the review there. So hopefully that was helpful to you guys. And we'll say good luck on your review test Wednesday.